Welcome everyone. I am Betsy Ludwig. I am the Executive Director for Women's Entrepreneurship uh, here at Northeastern University. And today we are having our fifth Miles Masterclasses. Those are Masterclasses in Innovation, Leadership, and Entrepreneurship. And they are mainly focused on helping to support our community with our community. So to highlight the great work that so many people are doing out there and um, so we can share knowledge and expertise amongst ourselves. Um, this is also part of the Demore McKim COVID Resilience Series. This is also their fifth one as well, which is excellent. And today we are having our masterclass called um, Demystifying Your Capital Raise, which is a um, topic that is very near and dear to my heart because as we know, women are vastly underrepresented um, with funding from venture capital um, and I think the statistics globally are about five to 10% of venture capital goes to women. We're also very underrepresented. This is what happens when capital community. So today, um, without further ado, um, I will introduce our panelists or speakers. Um, they are awesome. So we have Marjorie Radlow Zandi, who is an MBA of 83. And she's, um, well, not only an experienced entrepreneur, and a huge supporter of Northeastern's Women Who Empower program. Thank you for that, Marjorie. She's an angel investor, mentor, and consultant. We also have Emily Nagel Green, who's an independent board director and advisor. Um, she's also um, heading the All Raise Boston chapter, which she'll talk about. And I love, um, I'm always quoting Emily in this, and as she says, more is more. So more people involved in trying to solve this equation for women in entrepreneurship and funding, the better. And lastly, we have Katie Mulligan, who is a recent DeMore McKim graduate in the class of 19, and she's now a senior associate at Pillar VC. Um, so this is a great uh, masterclass this week that builds off of last week's masterclass, which is all about building your side hustle. So this week we're exploring um, really, is your business investable? And is it investable in this climate? And we're going to hear from these experts on, you know, what are the various ways to um, raise capital? And what are the different ways that investors look at uh, deploying their capital? So before we continue, I'm gonna have each of the panelists in, um, introduce themselves in their own words, so you get a feel for them. And we'll start with Marjorie and then Emily and then Katie. Marjorie? Hey, thank you. Um, so here's a little bit about my background. After Northeastern, I moved to Silicon Valley where I globally expanded several software companies footprint. And then I decided I wanna move back to Boston, took an equity stake in a food diagnostic business, and the name of it was Bicam, where I developed a global cross-cultural team and grew the business to over 100 countries. After growing it up, I sold it to a $2 billion player. I led the business for a number of years, and I recently transitioned into consulting. But for the past five years, I've also been part of Launchpad Venture Group. It's one of the largest angel investment groups in the US and the largest in the Northeast and it focus on, focuses on the scientific and tech ecosystem at Branch Venture Group, which focuses on food, ag, and food and ag tech. Thank you. Excellent, Emily. Hey, uh, very glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation, Betsy, and uh, very uh, happy to get to know Marjorie and Katie just a little bit. Um, I started my life as a software engineer back in the Stone Age and um, then I moved into marketing and uh, general management. And uh, for, the, for 10 years, I was a CEO in the tech sector. And the last company I led was a startup. Uh, I retired from that five years ago. And I now serve on four corporate boards, all the way from a company that does $750 million a year in revenue, publicly traded, down to a startup that uh, hasn't yet crossed over a million dollars in revenue. And I also coach first time CEOs. I picked up so many scars and made so many mistakes in my own decade as a CEO that uh, I, I figured out finally the way to recover from all those scars was to keep other people from making the same mistakes that I did. Uh, and finally, about six months ago, All Raise, the national organization that tries to accelerate the success of women funders and women founders, uh, decided to try to start up a chapter here in Boston, and I was invited to be part of that team. And I'm one of uh, three women, four women, three other women here in Boston who's been getting that 
uh, initiative going, and I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about all raise later. Thank you, Emily. Katie, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, for sure. Uh, hi, I'm Katie. As Betsy mentioned, I am a recent DeMore McKim grad, um, so don't have a very long career history, but um, I started uh, I started at Northeastern in 2014. I did my first co-op at Wellington Management, which is a big asset manager in Mayor London office, uh, and quickly realized that, that corporate life wasn't for me, but I did love Wellington and I love my team. Um, so I came back to Boston and, and joined IDEA, which is uh, Northeastern's Venture Accelerator. I encourage you all to check it out if you haven't already. Um, I sat on the investment team there, so we were looking at venture business plans for uh, whether or not they qualified for a $10,000 non-equity grant. And I was kind of like, this is a ton of fun. How can I do this for the rest of my life? Uh, and people were like, oh, that's venture capital. Uh, so that's kind of how, how I got started into venture. I did my second call up at Hercules Capital out in Palo Alto, and then I joined Pillar VC uh, as my third co-op and I never left. So I've been there for about two and a half years now. Oh, thank you, Katie. And I forgot to mention as well that Katie has been such a huge supporter of WISE, which is the Women's Interdisciplinary Society for Entrepreneurship, which is our student run club um, to promote more women and kind of redefine what it's like to be a woman on campus um, in entrepreneurship. And later on, we also have Fernanda Lopez, who is the co-VP of we build and she's going to give a rundown of some resources that people can take away with them if they want to um, look for further funding. So without um, further ado, we'll get the discussion going. I do want to encourage everyone to use the chat. It's really important for all of us to know what you're thinking, what your questions are. So please don't be shy. Um, ask anything you want and then we will have a live Q&A session at the end. This is an informal session. This is for you guys to meet each other, to know who each other is. Um, and, to, and to learn from the experts. So I guess what we want to really address today is, um, is your business investable? And I think where we start with that is we go for a general overview of what are the different facets of the capital raise. And I think, Emily, do you want to start us off by talking a little bit about this topic and the way uh, entrepreneurs should be looking at it? Sure, sure. The first thing I want to say uh, to anybody that is just getting started with building a business is that there is a lot of fancy vocabulary <laughs> in, uh, in, in startups, right? And Katie, probably you've, you've uh, seen your share of that. And I think fancy vocabulary intimidates us um, and maybe more intimidates women more than others. And I would encourage everybody to think of it like um, if you were going to France and decided to learn enough French to be able to tell a taxi driver where you want to go. Don't be intimidated by the, the fancy words. You, Investopedia is a great website. If you don't know what something means, just look it up. And don't assume that other people are smarter than you just because they're throwing around some fancy words. They're using it to make themselves look smart. So with, with that uh, disclaimer, the first thing I want to say is we're talking about uh, capital. And it's important to know the difference between dilutive capital and non-dilutive capital, because you will hear that term a lot if you haven't already. Non-dilutive capital is money you get that doesn't cause you to give up any ownership of your business. So if you got into an accelerator and won a cash prize, that would be non-dilutive capital. So there's a source of money that doesn't cost you anything. Dilutive capital is where you take money and you give up part of the business. You're essentially selling a piece of your company to someone else because you're convincing them that it will be worth more in the future than they're going to pay you for that share of the company today. So we're going to talk about dilutive capital. And there are a number of stages of raising money. And the next thing I want to say is that not every business goes through every stage. You don't need to. Some do and some don't. It's not a rule and there's not a, uh, there's not a set of laws around this. These are just things that have emerged to fund businesses, and it continues to change. It's changed a lot in the last 10 years. Generally, the, the earliest stage at which people uh, raise money that's dilutive is called friends and family, or f and F for short. And it doesn't necessarily mean that investors are limited to friends and family, but it, it usually means you're not going to raise very much money, maybe $100,000, something like that. And you might get it from family and friends because they know you best. 
And that's always an interesting stage to have gone through when you're raising money later on because people, other investors will look back and, that, and say, oh, you, you were impressive enough at an early stage to convince other people to invest. The next stage is uh, frequently called seed stage. Sometimes friends and family is called pre-seed. Uh, seed stage has emerged uh, more in the last 10 years than uh, it had before. And uh, it might be upwards of a million dollars. It depends more on the type of business. And people that put money into seed stage companies are usually angels, individual investors like Marjorie, and you're going to talk about your uh, philosophy. Or they can be institutional investors. And by that, I mean the broad class of, of companies that have collected funds to invest on behalf of other people. And that would include Pillar, where, where Katie is. A seed stage usually is for a company that hasn't gotten much done yet. They may have a, a proof of concept. You might have uh, not just an idea, but, but, but something that uh, has been proven to work, a technology that uh, works in a lab. And uh, you're, you're asking for money to grow the business further. After the seed stage, we get into a very complicated ladder that people call series, series A, series B, series C. And the investors that invest at those stages of your company tend to be institutional investors, venture capital companies, or a very important alternate class of investor that we generally call strategics. Large companies of, uh, for instance, an Amazon or an Uber that uh, are very interested in um, adding, augmenting the innovation in their own business by uh, capturing the possibility of um, maybe investing in your business as well. So they will invest alongside venture capital investors. So we have friends and family or pre-seed, seed, series A, all the way up to series D, E, and F if you're really a cash hungry business. Um, but let's hope you never have to go to series E and F. There's a lot of downsides to that. Uh, and the players, as I said, tend to be different at different stages. And the further along you get in investing uh, and, the, and the larger the amount of money, the more proof that your business needs to demonstrate that it's compelling and uh, the more people will expect of you when you're, when you're talking to them about uh, the process of investing in the business. I think I'll stop there. That was a pretty Kelly, long That speech. was such a great recap and I'm so glad that we recorded that because I think that, <laughs> that it really, really explained to people that um, there are these stages and they're not defined very properly and people have different meanings it depends actually if you're in boston or you're in san francisco and there are all sorts right. of like just like people think lockdown means something different and this um, <laughs> right. whole thing um so i guess you know now that we know the kind of basics of the the stages of uh raising money we're going to talk about the the pitch right and so that's a question i get quite a lot and i know that everyone on this call gets a lot we review a lot of pitch decks we um we look at a lot of different things and they all look very different. And I think Marjorie, um, because you're a very experienced angel investor and you work with lots of uh, national chapters on this, you see a lot of business plans. And so Marjorie, I was just wondering if you could, um, I know you wrote an article like on the, the five things you need to see before um, you invest. If you could walk us through what do people have to have in their pitch deck and what do they have to have done before they should approach an angel investor? Okay, good question. Um, and there are five key things and I'm going to say that I generally look for, but I would have to say some of the colleagues I have in my angel groups look for this too. Um, first is solid financials and projections. Um, it, they're really not secondary to new technology and new product offering. Knowing the numbers is key. So you've really got to know your revenue line, gross margin, net profit margin line, and, and really get a financial projections out about um, five years and really try to avoid the unrealistic projections doing 50,000 one year and the next year doing um, $10 million. It's, it's possible, but it usually doesn't happen. Um, and, and with that, um, have proof of a company's unique offerings within a total addressable market. Um, Emily's going to have a different answer in terms of the total addressable num market number, but for angels, it's $100 million. So, and to have the proof and unique position um, in terms of the offering. 
Um, the second thing um, I look for is team. The CEO and founder must be coachable. Um, if, you know, arrogance or know-it-alls can really doom the business from, from the start. And, and with that, the team really should have a, um, a, both a deep technical expertise in a particular market and also a market expertise as well. So it's really that technical wizardry and business know-how um, that's important. Um, now the third thing is a realistic valuation. There, um, some companies come and say, you know, they've been doing maybe $2 million in sales, unless it's very unusual, it's a, you know, 50 to $70 million valuation, that's, that's not going to work. It really needs to be a reasonable valuation in terms of where you are and what you see the traction to be. And, you know, otherwise you really, I, I don't see getting a lot of traction. Um, a fourth thing is, and it kind of, it's a little counterintuitive, but really begin with the end in mind. Um, look at what companies would acquire you once you build out the company over a number of years and look at similar deals that have been done. The investors are expecting a return. So just do the homework ahead of time and figure out what multiples there are or similar size, um, similar companies in a similar space. Um, and lastly, again, it seems like common sense, but respect. It's important that um, investors' questions are answered respectfully and really anticipate what questions are going to be asked um, of, of that so that you'll be able to answer that and assume that an investor doesn't have a deep knowledge in your ear. Some do, but many don't. So be careful to be able to explain that. Um, and I also want to point to a resource, which is from the um, managing director of Launchpad Ventures. It's um, Pitch Deck Fundamentals. He's also an ink columnist. And um, his name is Christopher Mira Bali that, that did this. And it's just a terrific resource that expands even more about what I've just said. Oh, that's great. Um, in fact, we'll try and dig out a link to that um, and put it on the chat for everyone. I haven't even read it myself. Um, but I just have a question um, that always comes up is how early should uh, potential companies approach angels? Um, do you think that they should build a relationship or they should wait to actually formally pitch to a, to a venture group? Like, what do you think that relationship management is like? I think once there's a proof of a concept and that some type of proof that there's going to be some type of traction in the market um, with a particular offering. So it shouldn't be like you, you have 10 different ideas and you're trying to narrow it down, really get an understanding of what the product or services and what you're potentially going to be um, going to be doing. You can kind of kick, maybe kick around a few ideas, but have a definite product there. But you can establish a relationship early because often um, a, a particular angel will be touching base from time to time to see how it's coming or you can reach out to them. But I, I would encourage that there be a reaching out. But again, it really, there should be some type of formalization what the product and service is and within a market that's being approached. That's great. Thank you so much. Oh, Emily, do you have something to add? Yeah, I, I wanted to mention that in, in my own uh, experience, it's, it's very helpful to ask in angels what kinds of businesses they like to invest in and what they don't. Because you could spend a lot of time getting ready to pitch an angel and then suddenly find out, oh, I don't do healthcare or... Um, I'm only interested in hardware products. And it's a, it's a great icebreaker if you happen to meet any angel investor to say, oh, tell me what kinds of businesses you like, right? And the angels tend to have a focus because it's the businesses that they know better, the business models that they're more familiar with, or where they think they would be more useful in providing advice. So it's a great uh, frame to think about getting acquainted with angels because there's you're just going to waste your own time if you approach angels that, that don't have interest in the kind of business you have. I think that's a really good point and I, I need to ask Katie a question before we run away with the conversation but I, I do want to just really make a point to to all entrepreneurs out there 
that every investor has their own particular sweet spot. They all have their own nuance. They all have their own amount of money at capital that they want to deploy. They all have their own strategy and that's part of them being unique. So if you don't have success with the first few people you talk to, whether that is friends and family or the angels or the VC, it doesn't mean that you necessarily have a bad idea. It just means you haven't found the right fit. I mean, it's a little bit like dating, right? It's not that they're bad ideas or bad people. It's just like, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So that's really important because I've talked to a lot of, especially women who go and talk to a couple of potential investors and they come back and they go, oh, we're not investable because they didn't like X. Well, X just wasn't for them, but there might be investors out there. There are plenty of fish in the sea. Um, So before we we kind of go much more into the fireside chat, I I definitely want to um, give the floor to Katie a little bit and her perspective, not only um, from sitting in an early stage VC company and how you guys look at things, um, some of the resources you have, but also maybe I'm, I'm just interested too to hear about your experience in VC as, as a young alum um, and kind of how you see the, the whole industry shifting a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll tackle the first one first. I can tell you a little bit about Pillar. Uh, so we are a seed stage firm focused only on Boston-based companies. So as Emily was explaining, the very earliest stages of company formation, um, sometimes people just come to us with a pitch deck and an idea. Uh, sometimes they don't even have a pitch deck, they just have an idea and a team. Um, so really, really early on. And, you know, one of the things that I like to tell people is that, uh, and we have this blog post on our, on our site, but it's like, you're never too early for VC, um, if you have the right team. And so I think that's one of the most important things that, that I'd like to drive home too, is that, uh, there is that early stage investors look a lot at your team. And so as Marjorie was explaining, like, do you have deep industry expertise? Do you have deep technical expertise or what's kind of the interesting edge that you bring and why are you uniquely qualified to start this business? I think that's an important thing. It's like, why you? Um, and so that's kind of what I'd say we look, we look for at, at early stage at the earliest stage at pillar. Um, and a, a lot of those other things that Marjorie mentioned too, like, uh, are you coachable? You know, are you a good person, you know, that we want to be around? I think the average venture capital relationship is 10 years, uh, which is longer than a lot of marriages. And so it really truly is a partnership from day one. And so finding a person that you drive, jive with and trust is really important too. Um, and so as a founder, it's just, just as much of an interview, you know, for the VC as it is the VC kind of interviewing you on the back end, I'd say. So, um, and then, you know, the second question you asked about being an, an early, uh, early in my career in VC uh, and as an alum, um, I'd say it's great. Definitely venture from a career standpoint is hard to break into, I'd say. And I got really lucky uh, that I came in through the co-op program. And so any of you Northeastern uh, undergrads, I, I recommend if you are interested in venture, try and get in through co-op if you can, because it was a great experience. Um, but I think the interesting thing is I've never had uh, operating experience, as they call it, or, you know, being that's when you have worked in a company before and built companies before. And I think to be a good investor in the long, you know, in the long run, you should have some sort of startup experience in order to provide relevant advice and um, and guidelines to, uh, to entrepreneurs that you're investing in. And so, uh, you know, just for me, I think that's been one of the most interesting thing is, things is figuring out how to provide advice and how to provide va- provide value when I haven't actually been on the other side of the table. Um, and I think, you know, long term, I will end up going and working in a startup one day or starting my own thing uh, before returning to venture just so that, um, you know, I can I can have had both sides of the experience. That's so interesting, Katie. Katie, will you tell us a little bit about um, Pillar's breakout program that you're taking applications mm-hmm. for now? Because I think that's something that a lot yeah. of early stage um, companies should should know about. Yeah. So what we found, like I said, we're we're investing at the earliest stages, um, and what we found is that there are a lot of people who are interested in entrepreneurship, um, but maybe don't have an idea or are too scared to take the leap, which is totally fine. It it is a scary leap, and so. Um, we created a six week long virtual program uh, to kind of guide entrepreneurs through the earliest stages of, of figuring out whether or not entrepreneurship is right for them, whether or not they should start a company and if they want to start a company one day. Um, so we'll walk you through 
you know, all the basics of VC. We'll walk you through, you know, getting, getting up and running with a pitch deck, um, building your team. So some of those really, you know, basic core things that you need to think about in the first 90 days of starting a company, uh, we're there to kind of walk you through those. Uh, you don't need an idea to join. You don't have to start an idea while you're in the program. You don't need to leave your job. Um, so it's really low risk. We just kind of want to teach people about, you know, whether you know, whether or not they should take the leap to start a company. Uh, so like Betsy said, we are accepting applications for that now and applications close on Friday. Um, so I'd encourage anyone who's interested to, to join. Um, I think someone just asked a question, Michelle, um, is the breakout program good if you already have an idea and a team um, or would that be too basic? <clears throat> no, so we, we have a mix of people who have, who have applied so far. So it's people who don't have a team, people who do have a team, um, kind of it runs the gamut, but uh, it really is kind of the basics of getting started from day zero to day 100. And so if you're kind of past day 100, and I'd say maybe, maybe it's a little past that point, um, or a little before that point, rather. Uh, but I encourage you to check out the website and, and read some of the materials. I think one of the best things about it, too, which I didn't mention, is that we're curating peer groups. Um, so we'll be breaking the cohort into small groups of about uh, 10 people so you can get to know other people um, in the program and kind of go through the experience together, which is always nice no matter what stage you are. So, Excellent. Um, so those, that's a great recap of kind of who investors are, what they're looking for, um, and, and some programs to help you. I want to turn our conversation now to the current climate, right? <laughs> like that's on everybody's mind. And it really drives that question is, is my business investable right now? Um, clearly, we've had a paradigm shift in all sorts of businesses. Um, and a lot of businesses are in a cash crunch. They're trying to extend their runways. I just wondered if each of the panelists might have a viewpoint on tips or, or ideas for companies who are either in the pre-funding um, stage to make more from, from less and, and what they can be doing to make themselves look more financially viable and what you've been seeing out there in the current <clears throat> climate. Um, Emily, I don't know if you want to start with that. Sure, sure, happy to. First, first thing I want to say is there, there is money out there, right? There is plenty of money. I have seen several deals get done just in the last couple of weeks, just in my local environment. So um, the, um, the first thing everybody needs to understand that this is not a black and white scenario. This is a, a crisis that was not caused by a financial collapse, right? So people that had money to invest still have money to invest. They're thinking differently about where the best places are to put that money, but, but they are still writing checks. Um, if you are trying to manage with very little money, right now, whether you have some or are about to go after some, uh, the first thing I would not be doing right now is paying rent anywhere, right? Because we've all proven to ourselves that we can work from home. So whatever your plans for renting office space where hopefully you've killed those, I just helped somebody get out of an office lease. Um, I want to uh, give a shout out to um, programs like Northeastern's co-op program. I personally benefited so much from the amazing talent that comes through the Northeastern co-op program. I had fantastic Northeastern co-op uh, people, and it was a great way to get work done uh, without making a permanent commitment to a hire, right? It was just a couple of months, and great way to get uh, proof of, of some of your business established. How do you think about the test, the test that you can do to start to um, take your idea and make it real and make it viable and say, yes, there are customers out there. Yes, we know what they would want. So testing and research is something that you can do on the cheap with, with interns or co-op students. Some of the, a lot of people are going to be looking for that kind of work right now. Uh, and there are a lot of good online tools for mocking up products. Google has great uh, qualitative and quantitative research products. So I would emphasize it's a great opportunity to get your product idea right before you go out and look for money because you have the time to do it. What else are you going to do? I'd also just add that I think early, early stage startups right now are at an advantage because it's not like you were expecting revenue anyways. And so, you know, I think you should just go on with, you know, with your plan, uh, build your product um, because you weren't expecting money anyways. So the current environment doesn't necessarily impact that revenue side of things. 
And um, I'm just going to add that there are some businesses, I think Emily kind of spoke to that, that are actually going to get more money than they ever wanted to raise. Um, for example, one of my investment is in content analytics for TV and streaming. They went out to get um, a half a million dollars and they almost got $2 million um, because there was so much interest in them. So it's just, it really, it really depends. Um, and even a solar panel, there's a company that Launchpad portfolio companies, which I've invested in also called Energy Sage, um, which is a kind of an Amazon or an energy list for solar. And that is doing extraordinarily well. Um, and lastly, there's a cybersecurity super early stage company, which um, I personally thought would take about a six months to nine months to scale. Just talked with them. They said, we are going to need money fast. There is so much interest. They do cybersecurity for database. With everyone working at home, there is just an intense interest. They haven't done much advertising and marketing at all. They're just getting a slew of interest. So really focus on the sector um, given today's environment. That's, that's fascinating. In fact, I had a conversation earlier this week with, with another masterclass host in a couple of weeks um, in the healthcare sector. And that's also a sector where we're seeing a lot right. of money going in for telemedicine right. and, and healthcare right. delivery through um, digital formats. So I think, um, you know, if you're in a business that wasn't necessarily taking advantage of the current trends right now, if you can easily pivot and um, leverage yourself into those. I think that that's probably a, a good idea. Um, so that's great. I don't know if anyone has any uh, questions on the chat about that. I didn't see any come in. And if not, I want to turn um, now our conversation beyond this. And you know, this is um, an event sponsored by the Women's Entrepreneurship Initiative. And I do want to talk a little bit about uh, the differences between men and women in the fundraise process. Um, I'm a big fan of this article from, from HBR, which goes over the research that um, men and women get asked different questions in the funding process. And it's something I talk a lot about to female founders. And I was just wondering if everyone could kind of talk about what they see on either side of the table and if they have any advice, particularly for women when they're going through this, through this process. Yeah. I'll I'll jump right in. I absolutely personally experienced that in my last company, and it was before I knew it was a thing. I would come out of pitch meetings, just, to, just let me back up, the, the, the basic premise of the article that you're referencing, which is a fantastic read, because it's an eye-opener, is that women are more likely to be asked questions about things that would prevent the business from being successful, and men are demonstrably more likely to be asked questions that would promote the success of the business. So the questions that men get tend to be questions that allow them to talk about the potential of the business. And the questions women get tend to be ones that force them to talk about the risks and the potential downsides. I totally experienced that. I couldn't put my finger on it until I read the story afterwards. And um, you can't stop the questions people ask you. And in fact, you want people to ask you questions. The worst pitch I've ever done is when people sat and, and had no reaction whatsoever. But you have to shift your answer um, to something that gives you the chance to talk about the positives and the promise and the opportunity that you see. I mean, I think any entrepreneur should be ready to talk about the risks and the, and the mitigation strategies they have for the things that could go wrong. But if that's the only thing you talk about, people don't see your optimism and the opportunity. And the most investable business, one of the core premises is that you have an opportunity to get really big. So if you don't get a chance to talk about how is the business going to get really big, you're not going to make the right kind of impact. So reframing the question from a prevention question or answering the prevention part as concisely as you can and then transitioning from the prevention answer into a related issue. In my last business, I got asked a lot of questions about the health department because we were selling food. And I had to transition from, yes, we understand what the health department regulations are. Yes, we have the appropriate insurance. I had to find a way to end the answer on something that was a lot more dramatic about expansion potential. And, and Emily, sometimes when I start to talk to women about this, they, they say that they feel uncomfortable about maybe um, misrepresenting themselves about talking about potential and market growth if they don't know that they can get there. Um, what advice do you have 
to them about how to promote themselves and their business? Get over it. <laughs> Get over it. I mean, you're selling, right? You, if, if you want to build a business and you believe in yourself and you believe it has potential, then one of the most important things you have to get good at is sharing that enthusiasm and conviction with other people. And angel investors like Marjorie and VCs like uh, Pillar all know that you don't have a crystal ball on the future and that there are a lot of things that can go wrong. They know that. And uh, they probably know more of the things that can go wrong than you know for your own business. But they do need to see your enthusiasm and your belief in the possibilities. And so you have to be a salesperson for your own business. If you don't show that you believe in it, you don't make other people believe in it. I'd also add one, one thing we tell people at Pillar is like, we are automatically going to apply a 20% discount to any financials you give us. So don't apply your own 20% discount, you know? Great. So like, uh, there's no reason to, you, you see a lot of founders come in being like, Oh, this, you know, this is the best, you know, not the best case scenario. This is like, what's definitely what we can do. And you're like, okay, but what, you know, show me what's going to happen if you knock it out of the park. Um, right. and so don't be afraid to do that. Right. And I'm going to come at it at a different angle. The groups that I'm part of are very diverse. Um, they're diverse in terms of male, female. They're diverse in terms of people from all different races and cultures and parts of the world. And I think that diversity makes it rich and it makes it more comfortable for everyone, both the entrepreneur to pitch and for the, for the whole ecosystem. I think that's that's really interesting. Now, Katie, I want to go back to a point where you were just talking about um, with the um, the discount on the financials, because this is also something that I talk to to uh, entrepreneurs about a lot. And I was part of a, a startup years ago that became very successful and raised a ton of money. And we always went into every um, scenario with what we called our base case, and then our like you know a high end. I can't remember a best case, and then a worst case. And so it really showed and gave us the ability to kind of do that like out of the box thinking like if all goes well and we could wave our magic wand, how amazing the business would be. And then, oh my God, what if it all goes wrong and this is the worst case? But actually in between that, there's, there's a really solid business case. And it really gave us a good framework to talk about all those ups and downs um, without looking kind of silly on either side of it. Do, do you guys still see people coming in with multiple like best case, worst case scenarios, or are people just kind of coming in with the, the, the one? Well, a lot of times people don't have financials <laughs> at all. Uh, it's a rare day that we get a, uh, you know, a pitch stick with, with financials. That's because we're looking at, at startups, like I said, very early stage. A lot of them are university spinouts or it's just like a PhD or a postdoc. They might not even know how to build a financial model. Uh, but those kind, those aside, we do see uh, some serial entrepreneurs who have who have built financial models, and they do do the the base case, best case, and worst case. I'd say a lot of times, though, that um, the base case is sometimes still almost too realistic. Like we want the base case to be the the best case, and we want the best case to be the moonshot almost. Um, and so uh, we definitely do see it, but we do kind of recommend, like even with the base case. Um, you assume that your team is going to execute like crazy and do super well. So, so show it. That's, um, that's really great. Now, I just want to ask the audience if anyone has any, um, any questions or they want to speak um, to the group. If, if you do, just in the chat, just say RTS, which says request to speak. And, and Krista, you, you wrote here that you had the exact same experience um, that Emily was talking about. Do you want to share that with us a little bit? Because I think it's always important to hear from, from people on their experiences. Sure, yes. Yeah. So I have a background where I've worked in a couple of different industries and I've led strategic programs and so forth. And I've been involved in startups and then involved in some turnarounds. And in my career, um, I've had an opportunity to pitch or work with people to pitch three times. And two of those was in biotech and one was in high tech. And Emily, when you started to talk about how you didn't know it was a thing at the time, I felt exactly the same way. In fact, I think in my career, um, I won't date myself, but well, I will, I'm almost 50. And back in the day, you just kind of went along with everyone else and you're just looking around and you do the same thing. But what I found was that um, I was asked questions that was more about me 
and less about the company. And that happened in all three cases. And it wasn't until I want to say maybe four years ago that I started to hear from other, especially women, where, oh, that happened to me too. And then with, with my male counterparts, they say, oh, no, that never happened to me. And it was a situation where I, I don't mind selling. I want to sell. I, and I want to be challenged with things because that's where you find out, oh, that's a blind spot. I should probably, you know, we all say that the first few pitches, that's when you learn the most. And that's when you realize how unprepared you are to pitch. But it's really good. And when you're working with the right people, they're going to mentor you. They're going to help you. They'll nurture that. You know, it's not about slamming down people who don't know. It's about building up great ideas. And rising tides lifts all boats, as, as they say. But I found I was getting questions like, um, so the last time I pitched was about five years ago, formally. And uh, I was getting questions like, well, well, what was your GPA when you were an MBA student? Well, um, so you did all of those things, and, and I was 42. You did all of this, and you're 42. How are you able to do so much? And I'm sitting there thinking, I, <laughs> well, yeah. I think I'm insulted. I mean, how yeah. many companies that are like 30-year-olds, you know, 20-year-olds? I'm thinking, I would, I would guess somebody would not ask that question at, at my age at the time. So when you started speaking to that, Emily, I, I felt exactly the same way. And I felt the most of the time, I, I'll tell you that it, it, took, it took a lot for me to not fall into the trap where I was defending my capabilities and my competencies because after, you know, the first question you feel like they're interested. And the second question you feel like they're interested but maybe a little suspicious. And then by the time you're answering all these questions about yourself personally, you, you start to be, you start to think, well, you know, I'm here to talk about the company, not, right. about, not about me. And, and I have a lot to do with the company, but I, you know, I'm a part of a team and that's what we're trying to promote. And so, you know, I've, I've been in front of a lot of different people to pitch. I've been in equity to pitch a lot of turnarounds. So it's not just startups. So this, I'll say it happened in three cases. They weren't all nightmare cases. They weren't all, you know, that's, I wouldn't say it's norm, but it's very, I think it's very unusual for me to look back in my career and say, wow, that happened on three different occasions. And one of them felt more defensive than the other two. The other two just felt, they were like, wow, that's, that's amazing. As I'm in a room full of men. Go ahead, Emily. Well, thank you. For, I, thank I just you. wanted, I wanted to say something about that. I, I, um, I have done a ton of pitching and I have helped a lot of people pitch. And one of the things that, that I think I've figured out is, uh, duh, uh, men do tend to get the benefit of the doubt in terms of competency, right? If you look competent and you're a dude, people assume you're competent, but women don't necessarily get the same benefit of the doubt. And I, I generally tell people when they're pitching, tell me the team story later. I want to know what the business is. What's the big idea? I want to hear that first. But I generally, with women founders, I generally say, you need to start out and establish your bona fides because you might you may not get the benefit of the doubt. You may lose their interest before you get a chance to start. And you need to start and say, look, I'm an engineer and I've done this and that. And this is what drove me to start the business. And this is what I'm really good at. And this is why I'm and I will tell you about the rest of my team. But here's and, and just to start off and set a platform of competence so that they don't get to discover how smart you are later on. Right. Well, and on that, I had, um, I had a student on in a class the other day who shared the story that her mom and dad owned a business together. And when they went and talked to investors, her mom would get all sorts of questions about what, what her husband was thinking and why, you know, that she wasn't really an equal partner. And she actually was more of the driver of the business where her, her husband wouldn't get that. And so this, is, I mean, it's just pervasive everywhere. Um, I mean, another anecdote is um, I was speaking to the woman who runs the NASDAQ accelerator out in San Francisco, and they've, very, they've been able to get 50% men and women. And I said, how have you been able to do that? That's really impressive. She said, we had to reframe our questions, our application questions, so many times so that we distilled really the competency of the founders. Because we would have two people with the exact same business and their financial projections were wildly different. The men were kind of always the next unicorn and the women were like, here, you know, here's my like on the straight and narrow kind of projections that were always dampened. And they were doing the exact same, same thing. So I think all of these things are, are very um, interesting. We have a couple more questions coming in from the chat now. Um, and there was one from, um, from Bora who was asking about the, the investing oh, hardware. 
um, yeah, hardware versus yes. software and web services and, and what's the current climate on that impact? Can any of you comment on that? I can a little bit. I mean, uh, at Pillar, our last two deals have been hardware deals, not software deals. So I think there's definitely still appetite for it. Um, but I, I do think sometimes hardware startups can take more money to to like build your thing. And so just creating a good plan for um, how you're going to do that on the cheap for, for right now would be useful. I, I think the, um, the wrap that hardware startups have gotten uh, and you hear it maybe more in Boston than you do in other parts of the country is that they do require more capital to get off the ground. As Katie, you observed the other thing that um, investors tend to worry about is that they're easier to copy, right? Once you've built something, you can, somebody can buy it off the shelf and take it apart and figure out how to build it for less somewhere else. And so you don't retain a defensive moat. Uh, but that said, there are plenty of hardware startups and there are accelerators in the Boston area that are dedicated to supporting hardware startups like Bolt, B-O-L-T, based in downtown. Um, there just aren't as many. And the reason that VCs like software companies is they are very capital efficient and they have potential enormous leverage. You know, you, you build some, write some code, the next person you sell it to doesn't cause you a lot of incremental expense. And so you have this relatively modest investment and you can grow revenues off of that base and the relative profitability of the business can increase dramatically and that's that's super sexy for an investor that's great now guys i'm just conscious of time i think fernanda has um a question about um keeping yourself motivated through the process so fernanda yeah for sure thank you all um my question is I've heard a lot of people in the VC space sometimes feel so discouraged after not landing a deal or so much research that goes into it. Like, how do you keep yourself motivated to say, I'm going to keep going, I'm going to keep researching deals and also not burning out in the process? Emily, do you, I can take that from an angel perspective. Um, I Let's guess I'll start, you can add on with the VC perspective. I don't, um, there's so much interesting technology out there, whether it's in, um, there's so much life science interesting technology, and right now there's major problems to solve, um, and, and so much innovation out there, whether it's, um, again, as I said, life science or food or food tech or personalized medicine. Um, I don't um, find myself or uh, colleagues at the various groups I'm in, um, you know, we don't, we're not we don't burn out because there's just so much interesting Avengers out there that, that pique our interest and um, look at, really look at everything from a future perspective. What, what the world gonna look like in 10 years? Um, that's, that's interesting. So Emily, I don't know that you wanna add on to that. Well, I would say on the entrepreneur side, um, you just have to kiss a lot of frogs and every frog you kiss is one that, you know, throw over your shoulder and find the next frog. I mean, it takes a lot of ask. The, 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 the wonderful stories that you read about of somebody who, you know, raised the $10 million with a drawing in the back of a napkin. And, uh, you know, those are the exceptions. I mean, fundraising is really, really hard work. And people tell you all kinds of things. They tell you your baby is ugly and they give you all kinds of uh, sometimes useful and sometimes pointless exercises to do and then they stop answering your emails and um, it, it, it can be if you let it pull you down it will be really enervating but you have to be prepared you know to get through all those no's to get to the yes and um, you have to be willing to encourage yourself because not a lot of other people will give you encouragement and so I'm a big fan of positive self-talk I started this for a reason it's still a good reason. I still like what I'm doing. I'm proud of it. I can't wait to find somebody else that wants to hear about it and just pick yourself up and keep going. But it is, it's brutally, brutally hard. I, Emily, I think that, that, that that's a great, um, oh, Katie, did you have something to add? Yeah, I was just gonna say one, one thing that, that we recommend people do at Pillar 2 is to put a lot of work in on the front end. Um, like spend hours and hours on, and hours on your investor list and who you're gonna reach out to. 
Because a lot of times, like the reason that, you know, someone might say no is that like, oh, we don't invest in Michigan com based companies. And you're like, okay, if I had just spent 10 minutes on the front end, like researching that, I wouldn't have gotten that no. And so um, sometimes it has nothing to do with you. It's just all about their strategy or they invested in a competitive deal and that has nothing to do with you and your company. And so the more you can research and spend time on the front end, figuring out who the people are that you should be reaching out to, I think. Um, hopefully the less, the less no's you'll get and, and the less be and up you'll be. And that's also great, great advice. I mean, just understanding those sweet spots for various investors. And, and Emily, I loved your point there about you have to kiss a lot of frogs. And, and I just try and tell myself and I tell my kids, you know, you have to remember Michael Jordan didn't make a seventh grade basketball team. Dr. Seuss didn't get a book deal. JK Rowling was turned down for Harry Potter for like a million times. Like, it, it, it does take perseverance and it is like it is the exception and not the rule to kind of meet that that match at the beginning. Um, and I, I think that entrepreneurship is definitely in, in that space. Um, at this point in um, our conversation, I'm going to turn it over to Fernanda Lopez, who's going to just share with us just a, a slide with some resources for where to go, especially for women to um, understand next steps with funding. We did have a question in the chat. Um, that said, you know, it's easier to find the sweet spot for VCs because they have websites. Um, angels seem a little bit harder. And, um, you know, Marjorie obviously is part of Launchpad, which is a national network. Um, and, and I think Br Branch um, also uh, angels. We have lists too of all of the angel networks. Um, those are publicly available. They are, it's hard to sort through them all because there are a lot. Um, but Fernanda, I'm gonna just turn it over to you right now just so you can share um, what we have and then she'll put some links into um, the chat. I, I just wanna say that you know, there are a million people we could have had for this call. Maybe we'll do follow-ups on these. There are people who have really interesting insights and we do have personal relationships with a lot of these firms. So you know, reach out if you want introductions or if you just want more information. So Fernanda, thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Betsy, and to all the speakers, that was super useful information. I have my notes already so full, so I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, Betsy, would you be able to give me co-host access? Oh, sorry, did I not? Um, hold on, sorry. No worries, thank you so much. Uh, you can share. Okay. Oh, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Perfect. So as Betsy mentioned, I am part of WISE, and WISE is Northeastern's Women's Interdisciplinary Society of Entrepreneurship. Our mission is just basically us being dedicated to showcasing entrepreneurship um, in a light from different majors and different disciplines from students and helping women specifically develop an innovative mindset. Um, and we do this through our three different programs that we have, which is We Learned, We Build, and We Support. I'm very excited to be co-leading the Weeble program along with Sandy Lynn this upcoming fall. And just to tell you a little bit more about it, Weebuild is focused on teaching the necessary hard and soft skills of a cohort of women who are interested in taking their passion project into an actual venture. So whether that's a nonprofit organization, a blog, or a YouTube channel, we really want to make sure that they feel supported throughout their journey at Northeastern. And you can check out some of, our, some of our classes, which are all around design thinking, ideation, building an MVP, and other important things also as navigating imposter syndrome. And you can also see the picture of our We Build cohort. And that has been such an amazing pro program and empowering people to really make sure that they have the resources available to know that they can do it, and especially female entrepreneurs. And so, we wanted to share some of our resources that we have researched for our community, but also for everyone on this call. And a lot of the speakers also have experience in this field, so I encourage you to also ask questions. We have All Rise, as we mentioned, which basically equips female founders and funders with access, guidance, and support to accelerate women's success and push the entire industry forward. Then we have other organizations like Chloe Capital, Victor's Capital, and we'll share this link, this deck so you can get access to the links. Some other organizations like iPhone Women is a place to raise capital, get coaching, make connections, and be part of funding in startups. So I've had personal experience with this. It's a little bit of a crowdfunding um, type of platform, but it's so effective and there's so many great people in it. 
the City of Boston Women's Advancement Division, they really are focused on promoting gender equity by empowering women and removing systematic barriers to make sure that they're making a push in their advancement. And as Katie may mentioned in the call, there's also the Pillar VC Breakout Program. This is a six-week six virtual program for a select group of people who are considering building a new startup, um, whether they have like a really set idea or a team. There's going to be a lot of informative content, peer support, and personalized coaching from experts. And also Launchpad Venture Group. Again, we'll be sharing the links down in the chat. But we're so excited to be sharing these resources with, with you all. And we're going to be working on creating a more comprehensive list that can hopefully help everyone in this call get more information and access to funding your own business. Thank you so much. Of course. Fernando, that was excellent. Um, I hope that was useful for everyone. And before we wrap up, we have just a few minutes. I wanted to say thank you, thank you to our panelists uh, for taking time out of their day and sharing all that great insight. I think that that was amazing. I think it was a great conversation. I feel like we could we could have a whole like three days on the, on these topics. Um, I do want to make a shout out for our next Miles um, master classes, which I'm also putting in, in the chat. We have three coming up. Next week is a master class in entrepreneurial resilience. Um, and that will be led by Helen Russell, who's the founder of Equator Coffees and a, a Northeastern graduate. And she's gonna talk about how community is so important in building um, entrepreneurial resilience, especially for women and actually some of the challenges of keeping community going in this digital age now that we can't go in and hug people or have meetings or in-person events. So she's going to talk a lot about how she's pivoting her coffee business, which is such a face-to-face -face business um, to, to be more, more digital, but keeping that community aspect. And WISE also will be part of that um, as well. We then have um, healthcare funding during the COVID crisis. That's on June 3rd. Um, Nancy Brown and Ann Corcoran um, will be talking about the trends and predictions they see in that industry. The week after that, um, we're gonna be joined by um, a couple of icons in the FinTech sector. Uh, Suzanne Hennestad will be joining us from Norway to give us um, kind of trends and predictions on global FinTech and Sarah Biller um, and Julia McCarthy uh, will be talking about what's happening in Boston and, and what are the opportunities in FinTech. Um, so I think that that's it for today. I also just one last little plug for those who are part of the Northeastern community. Uh, we have launched um, the sale program. Um, that's an app on your phone to really log all of your experiential learnings and to map them throughout the course of your life. All of these masterclasses have been um, logged as opportunities and you can get credit for them um, in that um, in that tool. So I just um, wanted to plug that. And I think that that is all. Have I forgotten anything in particular? Um, oh, and there are more COVID, um, DeMore McKim COVID um, resilience uh, classes as well. And Liza, if you want to put those into the chat, um, you could put those as well. So thank you all for joining us for this, for this lunch hour masterclass. Um, we'll be sending out a feedback form because we want to keep the these kinds of um, programs going to support our community and really um, praise and, and showcase our alums who are doing amazing things and our friends like Emily and our community members. Um, so thank you all and have a great day. Thank, thank you. you, lots of fun. Thanks everyone. Everybody. Thank you, Katie. Bye.